All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Ryan. Welcome to our third annual International Kleefstra Syndrome Family and Scientific Conference. Uh, really excited for the next three days. Uh, a lot of information about some of the latest and greatest news, things we've been working on. Uh, you can see on the screen with me right now is Eric Sheff, uh, Chief Scientific Officer for iDefine, and he's going to kick us off uh, with an overview of what we're working on, projects, and what to expect over the next three days. So, Eric, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks, Jeff. So, good morning, everybody. Good evening. Uh, maybe good middle of the night, depending on where you are. Um, thanks so much for joining. Uh, so, I have the privilege to uh, start this conference off. And like Jeff said, I'm really excited for the next few days. Um, so, what I wanted to talk about was... Um, uh, getting to a treatment for Kleefstra syndrome, which I think is something we all are hoping for, uh, and how that needs to really be a community project. And by community, I mean more than just the patient community. It's about the researchers and the drug developers and um, and many other folks, and how we need to all be working together and pooling in the same direction to, to make this happen. So when we started I define our purpose was right in our name, and it was to define a new future for those living with Kleefstra syndrome. And we felt like there were three big pillars that needed to be addressed for that to happen. And one of them was to find targeted treatments for those with KS. Um, and by targeted treatments, I wanna uh, be clear when we talk about targeted treatments, what we mean is a treatment that really addresses the underlying cause of the condition, the underlying biology, as opposed to you know a symptomatic treatment. So for example, a child who has seizures, of course, you'll treat that child with a anti-seizure medicine. But that's more symptomatic treatment. So um, we think what's needed is targeted treatment. Um, and at the same time, we wanted to improve clinical care and we wanted to build community. And I'm going to primarily focus on that first item of, of potential treatments today. Um, but uh, I also will touch on improving clinical care and building community. And I'll discuss how the two, those other two items really feed into the first. And I think it's really important uh, for the patient community to understand how much that matters. So for us, you know, everyone who was involved in found, founding iDivine and everybody who's working on iDivine now has an affected family member. And so patients are why this is personal for all of us. Um, and everything we do, we try to focus on that question of how do we improve the lives of patients and their families. And I think in terms of how we might get to a treatment someday, there's kind of a misconception that where treatments come from is a drug company comes up with a treatment, brings it to market, and then you get a treatment, right? You wait and then it shows up. Um, and that's just not how it really works. There's a whole ecosystem that has to be engaged with to get there. Um, you need researchers who are gonna build knowledge, who are going to develop an understanding of the disorder, and they're gonna find possible leads that could become a treatment someday. Um, you need groups like uh, CROs, so contract research organizations. These are companies that provide research on contract like they sound like. Uh, they provide repeatable solutions. They provide expertise in particular areas that can help. Uh, you need the clinicians engaged. They're the ones who are going to really build clinical knowledge about the condition. They're going to support patients um, in the immediate term, but they're also going to be the ones who would run a clinical trial at some future point. And you need government engaged because government provides a lot of the infrastructure um, and ultimately you know, they're going to approve a treatment or not approve it, right? So this like FDA in the United States, EM, EMA in the in Europe, um, you have to you have to be able to go to them with something that can be approved. And so all of these parts are kind of this big machine that has to work together. And so our focus is how do we always bring the patient voice to all parts of the way this machine is working? How do we influence it to make it work better? Um, and sometimes that means that we are almost like the oil, you know, on the gears to make sure everything's turning and working the way it should and moving forward um, with a focus on patients. And that can go all the way from making an introduction because we we know everyone and we realize there's two people who aren't talking to each other and they really should know each other, something really small like that, to funding projects that we think are high value and would be high impact um, for the community to push this whole process forward. And so I'll go into uh, the areas that we're we're working on, like Jeff said, and I'm also going to spend a good deal of time talking about the presenters at this conference um, and how they fit into this whole kind of process that we all hope to see move forward in the years to come. So how to get to a treatment? It really kind of boils down to four big things that have to happen. Um, 
One of them is we really need to improve our scientific understanding. So we need to build an understanding of KF at a really fundamental level. There's a lot known already, but we can always learn more. The next is we need to find leads. And so that means finding things that these are not going to be a treatment right away. They're not even going to be close to a treatment. They're going to be things that might become a treatment in the future. They're a lead. They're a possibility. But we need to find more of those. Um, we need to get ready for a clinical trial. And that sounds weird because we don't have something right now that's ready to bring into a clinical trial as a community. But it takes a long time to get ready for trials. And you want to be ready so that if something comes, you can move in right away. Because the worst thing would be you find a really promising lead and then you're not ready for a trial. And so you wait for that preparation to happen. And then you're waiting and waiting and waiting. And we don't want to be there. We want to be ready. And then finally, we really want to have the patient community supported and activated um, and understand the community, the journey that people are going through and, and understanding the patient population really well. So I'm going to touch on all four of these items. I'm going to talk about the presenters at this conference and how they fit into each of these lanes and kind of where they're working that's helping move this forward. Um, and then what we're doing as an organization to try to move it forward, we being I define to try to move it forward ourselves. So let's start with improving scientific understanding. So what that means is understanding, you know, at a cellular level, what the consequences are of the loss of function in one copy of EHMT1. And that is the fundamental um, issue in Kleefstra syndrome, right? You have two copies of EHMT1. One of them has a mutation or a deletion, and that loss of activity causes the syndrome. And we do know quite a bit about it, but again, we can always learn more. And then the next thing is understanding at a clinical level, what are the manifestations of that loss of EHMT1? What does it mean clinically? And how do these two things interrelate? And indeed, what we really want to understand is that full interplay, of what's happening in the cell and what's happening in the patient and how do all of those things connect to each other? But one thing I want to say before we move forward is just a huge thank you to the people who have been studying uh, Kleefstra syndrome over the years. Uh, we are really fortunate as a patient community that there have been some fantastic people who have done a lot of work on this syndrome for a long time, and quite a bit is already known. Um, we all the time, as we work in the rare disease space, um, we meet other groups that uh, are working on their rare disease, and a lot of times they have the gene, and they know a tiny bit maybe about what it does, and that's all they have. Um, and so we are we have a gigantic leg up. Um, because so much work has already been done. So I just wanted to make sure to say thank you. And some of the folks who have been doing a lot of that work are going to be pre presenting at this conference. Uh, really looking forward to hearing their updates. So Neil is going to be talking about the Brain Model Project, which is a really exciting project, which is including Kleefstra syndrome as one of the syndromes it's studying. And that really is to do kind of what I was talking about, of trying to do work to correlate what's happening in model cell lines with what's happening in the actual patient. And, and better understand the interplay of those two items so that it's uh, to get a, get, a, get a handle on way, how we might treat the disorder. Um, Carl is going to be talking about work that he's done, uh, better understanding the consequences of the loss of EHMT1 um, in cell model lines and doing some in-depth work that he's been uh, looking into. And then uh, Dr. K is going to do a bunch of updates on several projects that have been happening in her lab. Um, so looking forward to hearing from all of them. Um, and then some even more people doing some of that that fundamental work that needs to be done. So Hans is going to be talking also about cell model line work. And he's also going to be talking about the possibility of upregulating the um, wild type allele, that is the copy of the HMT1 that's uh, functional in Kleefstra syndrome. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more later. Um, that is one of the possible strategies to uh, potentially treating Kleefstra syndrome. So Dr. Sid and uh, Kimberly Wiltrout are going to talk about seizures, which is a definitely an important topic for some families um, in Kleistra syndrome. They've been looking into the features of seizures and the patterns that they're finding, and so I'm really excited to hear from them. Um, and then Jonathan is going to be talking about sleep, which of course is also really important to a lot of Kleistra syndrome families. So he's been doing work to try to understand what's happening at the cellular level with the circadian clock versus what's happening in the patients. So really, really interested to hear his, his initial results. And then one thing I wanted to touch on that we're doing um, to help this whole process forward. So one of the things you need, as you've seen me, said, heard me say over and over, is cell model lines, cell model lines. We are making two uh, lines to provide to the community, to the research community. And the point of that is to ensure that any researcher that needs lines can promptly get them. Um, 
And then also to provide more diversity because different patient lines will have different characteristics because different patients are different. And so having more lines is inherently valuable to the community. So we're gonna be making those lines and making those available uh, as one of our projects. So uh, the next thing we need to be thinking about as a community is this pillar of finding preclinical leads. And again, a lead is not a drug. A lead is not a treatment. A lead is something that could become a treatment at some point in the future after it's proven out. So it's a lot like putting shots on goal. You're gonna make a lot of shots. Most of them are gonna miss. A few of them are gonna to appear to hit. Um, some of those may fail as you try to do additional validation. So we as a patient community have to be prepared that some things will maybe look kind of exciting. We'll hear about something that looks a little exciting and then it will turn out it's not really gonna work. Um, you have to do a lot of additional validation in preclinical models. Um, and then eventually, hopefully you have one that really stands up and this is really, this is really a hit. You really got one past the goalie. Um, and the idea is to get to that point where you can assemble this preclinical package and that package says, here's all this data that says there's a really good probability that this lead would succeed in a clinical trial and therefore it's worth it for somebody to spend the money to take it to a clinical trial. So clinical trials are incredibly expensive and so you have to do a lot of preclinical work to prove something out before you can get it to a clinical trial. So we need to do that first step of putting shots on goal and trying to find leads. And I Really excited to have Scott Dindo uh, presenting at this conference. So he's gonna talk about the process his team did to go through the preclinical development of a lead that made it to a clinical trial. So it's in clinical trials for another syndrome called Angelman syndrome. And Scott can't talk to us about the clinical trials, he's, but he is just gonna talk to us about the process they went through. And when I read their publication from his team, uh, I found it really inspiring how they really strategically approached the challenge and stepwise, you know, broke down each of the barriers and got through to figuring out how to find a, a, a lead for Angelman syndrome. And they were able to get that package together to the point that it, it justified a clinical trial. So they've gone to a clinical trial. So he's going to talk about how they did that process. And I think it's a really instructive example for us. Um, and I'm really happy and proud to say that Scott is part of the scientific advisory board for iDefine. So, and then Yael is going to talk to us about, um, uh, she's a drug developer. So she can really bring that perspective of the drug developer and what a drug developer wants to see um, in terms of uh, the early preclinical work to justify something you know, being worth moving forward. And she will also be talking about kind of what I'm talking about here is how we all kind of have to work together. Biotech, academia, patient groups have to all be working together as a community project to get us there together. Um, and then Igor is going to be talking about um, ASOs. And so I'm going to now just briefly talk about ASOs for the patient community. If you're not familiar with ASO technology, I've written a couple articles for the CSO Corner, for I Define CSO Corner. They've been in the newsletters. If you haven't seen those, I recommend you go read them um, at your earliest convenience. But just very briefly, what ASOs are and the reason that they're really interesting potential um, future treatment is that they are uh, a, basically in a nutshell, a programmable molecule that sometimes can help you adjust the, um, the function expression level, et cetera, of particular genes. And so in some cases they can be used to turn genes up or turn genes down. And so in the case of Kleister syndrome, because there is a loss of one copy of EHMT1, a lot of people have thought of the same concept of what if we could turn up the one copy that's still available and increase the expression. This is called upregulation. So Igor is trying to put shots on goal around upregulating EHMT1, and he's going to be talking about his efforts at this conference. So I'm really excited to hear his updates. We, I define, are also going to be taking a shot um, at doing an ASO um, treatment lead. So a preclinical lead. Um, we are working with a CRO called the Hoya Labs. And uh, basically, we're doing some additional experiments right now um, to validate the approach. We think we have uh, a path, but we want to validate a little bit more. And then if it looks good, we will do screening of ASOs to potentially upregulate EHMT1, see if we can put a shot on goal for this. And uh, Melissa is from La Jolla Labs is going to come and talk about uh, La Jolla Labs as a CRO, what they uh, bring to the table, their approach, and how they're trying to uh, basically enable rare disease organizations like ours to get that, you know, preclinical lead established. So that's coming up later at this conference, and I'm looking forward to hearing more from her. 
Uh, so I talked about this again a little a little bit length at length. Getting ready for a clinical trial, you want to be ready early, um, and so there's a few things you want to do when you're doing that uh, type of type of preparation. So one thing you want to do is you want to have centers of excellence. So you want to have places where there is real aggregation of knowledge. Um, you can build expertise. The uh, clinicians there have seen enough cases that they can really start to build a strong sense of the disorder, what's expected, how to treat it symptomatically. And these sites in the future can be also become the sites of clinical trials because you now have an established patient population, you have an expert team of doctors. And so when we first started up, we saw that there was a center of excellence in the Netherlands around Dr. K and all of her collaborators, but there really wasn't a place in the United States that could fill that role. And so we um, funded a clinic uh, with the help of the community. Thank you so much for your, for your help funding it at Boston Children's Hospital. And so I think by any measure, um, it's been a spectacular success. Um, they've seen a lot of patients. And I think there's also this kind of virtuous cycle where a lot of exciting work is now starting to come out of Boston Children's. There's a halo effect of of um, them assisting in a lot of projects. And so I, I'm just really excited about how this collaboration is going. Um, and I think we're all really proud of, of, this, um, of this accomplishment. So Zoe is going to uh, be updating us on the clinic um, and how it's going and, um, and what they've learned about the patients they've seen. So another thing you wanna do is, um, you know, is, really start to understand the lived experience of patients and families um, that experience Kleistra syndrome. So I think we all of us could say, well, I know what it's like, right? I'm, I have a family member, um, so I could tell you what it's like, but different patients have different experiences, different families have different experiences. And so the idea, there's really an established way to really start to rigorously understand this, and it's called generating a disease concept model. So the idea of a disease concept model is you literally are interviewing lots of families and sometimes the patients themselves and understanding their experience and um, and then putting all that data together to really build a, a rigorous model of what it means to experience this. Um, the other thing you get out of this that's really powerful is that it helps you determine what is what would be meaningful change for families and for patients. So um, the organizations like the FDA are really genuinely interested in patient-centered drug development and drug trials. And so in the future, when you're trying to structure a clinical trial at some point, uh, and you are trying to pick out what would be your endpoints, that is, what, how would you measure whether there's improvement or not improvement with a particular treatment? Uh, one of the things you want to consider is what matters to the families, right? Because if, if, a, if a treatment doesn't improve what matters to families, is it really a high value treatment? And the FDA pays attention to that. If they're seeing improvement in areas that the family say is really important, then that they weigh that. Um, so really understanding the disorder in a deep way is really important. And so we are sponsoring a project uh, with Boston Children's and with Boston University uh, to develop this disease concept model. And Kristen will be speaking more in more depth about DCMs. And uh, and the project she's going to be leading to develop this DCM for Kleistra syndrome. Another thing you want to be doing when you're getting ready for clinical trials is uh, understanding the natural history. And so the natural history is basically what would be the expected course of development um, if you didn't intervene in a condition. Uh, what would you expect to see from age, for example, four to five if you didn't do anything? Because if you don't have a handle on that, it's hard to understand what improvement would look like if you were to test a treatment in a clinical trial. And so that helps you define what would be the appropriate endpoints. Um, so this is an area where we definitely need to improve as a community is really rigorously understand the natural history. Um, and and um, Dr. K will be talking uh, about the natural history work that they've been doing. Um, previously, and we also want to add to that by doing this collaboration with Citizens. So Citizen is a uh, organization that will that has a way to basically ingest patient records in a secure fashion, and then from all that data, crunch that data and basically build like a virtual natural history. So with a, with a relatively low lift for families, um, we can basically generate, um, at least at a you know, high level, a natural history um, output for KS and understand it much better. 
And so uh, Virginia is going to be uh, is from Citizen, and she's going to be talking about this initiative and what Citizen brings to the table. And of course, we will be asking for the community to sign up and be a part of this. And so I hope you're excited after you hear from her about this opportunity. Uh, we really are excited about it. We think it's a, a big step forward. Um, and uh, hope everybody jumps in and, and contributes to that. Another thing you want to do to get ready for clinical trials is work on biomarkers. So a biomarker is something you can measure in a patient that says either the patient is improving or the patient is getting worse. Um, and that, so again, that's meaningful. Uh, so it can be like a blood marker, right? So in the, like a, by example, a biomarker is like cholesterol levels or a biomarker for heart disease, right? So here we'd be looking for biomarkers that are relevant and meaningful and measurable in Kleistra syndrome. And there aren't any known biomarkers right now. It doesn't mean they don't exist. So we're working with Combined Brain um, on a project that they're doing. So let me briefly introduce Combined Brain. So Combined Brain is an umbrella organization um, that we're a member of that uh, works with uh, a lot of the rare disease organizations in the neurodevelopment disorder space. And they exist to provide tools to generate initiatives and basically assist all of us so we can work collectively as a group because a lot of us have a lot of the same challenges and and push forward to the, the goals that we're all chasing, right? We all have these same goals. We all have similar challenges. And so they've started a project to create a biorepository for the conditions under their umbrella, of which Kleistra syndrome is one. And the idea is you build this repository you of, of samples like blood, and then you can uh, do studies on that repository to look for biomarkers. And you can also keep those samples. And in the future, if additional technologies come along, you can do additional studies. So by having a repository in place, it's really powerful. Um, there's what they're calling the biorepository roadshow. So they are um, going from town to town uh, in different locations to make it easy for uh, folks from the patient community to show up and uh, get a sample from their family member uh, provided to the biorepository. Um, if you're interested in participating, please email us at unlock at idefine.org and we'll get you started on that process. And I will talk a little bit more about this on the next page, but I just wanted to introduce the talk that Terry Joe is going to give. So Terry Joe is the leader of Combined Brain. And so she's going to talk about the whole Combined Brain umbrella organization, what they're doing, this project, other projects. Um, so really looking forward to hearing her updates. Um, a little more on this biorepository. So right now we have three contributors to it. Thank you so much for showing up. The goal is to get to 20 for this cycle. Um, and I just, I'm listing the most, the most, uh, the soonest opportunities. There are more, and we will continue to circulate those in the newsletter and so on in other locations. Um, but the upcoming ones in the near term, Denver, San Antonio, Washington, DC, if you live near any of those places and you are interested in uh, contributing, uh, reach out to us and uh, we will get you started. We also are now just setting up to allow collections at visits to BCH. So if you are a family that's seen at BCH and you are going to be going to BCH, uh, get in touch with us before your visit. Again, at unlock at idafine.org, we can get you set up with the whole consenting process. And then the great thing is you go into your visit like you would do anyway, you were going to go anyway, and you can give your samples while you're there. So it's really much more convenient way to do it. And so we're excited about this possibility and thanks to BCH for working with us on getting that, getting that going. Okay, so let's talk about patient community. Um, it's another really important factor. And, um, uh, and I, I think one of the uh, things to just mention too is, you know, again, Improving the patient care and the and the clinical understanding of the patient journey is just important in its own right. And I think there are two items, two presentations here that are, are really focused on just that. And one of those is Charlotte is going to be talking about the Kleistra Syndrome Guideline Project. So this is a really exciting project um, to build really solid fundamental guidelines about if you're a physician and you have a Kleistra Syndrome patient, these are the things you should be doing for that patient to support that patient appropriately. And so um, the team at in the Netherlands at Radboud and Erasmus are working on this. Uh, Boston Children's Hospital is working on this. Other groups are working on this who have some expertise in Kleistra syndrome. And they've all been working together to build a set of guidelines. So any doctor anywhere can look those guidelines up and get help basically with how should I be managing this patient. So it's a really exciting and really critical project. And at the same time, of course, it does further enhance our understanding of the disorder, of the natural history, et cetera. It's, it's 
a virtuous cycle to have this, but I think the number one thing is it's going to just improve care. So she's going to be talking about that project. And then Lottie is going to be talking about communication, which of course is another really important issue for our families. Um, and she's done a lot of really in-depth and substantial work on speech and language and how to improve, um, how to address those challenges um, uh, in, in KS patients. So I wanted to highlight those two talks. And then uh, the other thing you want to do when you're activating the community is really establish a census of patients um, who can be number one counted and number two be contactable so they can be contacted in the future. Um, so when I talk to drug companies, um, this is one of the first questions they ask, how many do you have that you can contact and where are they? Um, they want to know there. It's great. We, we know we know the approximate number of patients out there. So Kleistra syndrome is somewhere in the range of one in 25,000 or one in 35,000 people. You can really model this very effectively. Most of those people don't have a diagnosis yet, so we don't yet, haven't yet had the pleasure to meet them. Um, but we know they're out there. But what drug companies want and what a lot of other folks want is this kind of solid hard numbers, right? And so this map has been a really exciting project that we started. Thank you to everyone who's contributed. If you haven't yet signed up for the map, Please just search um, for Kleefter Syndrome Worldwide Map. You'll find it. It takes a few minutes to register, and then you'll be one of the little dots on the map. Um, and you can see how many people are near you. It's it's a it's a really exciting project, and um, it comes up all the time. Um, one of the places that came up was we recently went through the process with the CDC to apply for an ICD-10 code. So again, I had an article on this as well. The importance of ICD-10 codes in the in the uh, CSO corner. In it, um, so please look that up if you want to know more. But in short, these are the codes that are used to track patients in the medical system in the United States and a lot of other countries. So that you can code that this patient has condition X, right? There isn't one right now for Kleistra syndrome. And so that means that if you're going to the doctor, it's not in your record that, that the patient has Kleistra syndrome. Um, and so that means, you know, we're, we can't do these things right now where, where you can easily track patients, ensure best practice, is followed, easily study outcomes by pooling all the records for everybody that has KS in a health system, finding patients easily in the future in case there's an opportunity uh, for them to participate in studies or trials. Um, and so there's a whole process uh, 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 to basically apply for a code with the CDC. We went through that process and I'm delighted to report that we have received notification that we are gonna get a code. Um, so this is a huge accomplishment and we're really, really excited about this. Um, what that will look like is they will publish the code in around the May to June timeline next year. When that happens, we will share the new code with the community. And then that code is going to be live in most healthcare systems in October of next year. Um, and so once that happens, we will be asking everybody to next time you see your doctor say, please use that code, please put in that code so that my child, my family member is properly tracked in the system. So. I wanna make a big thank you to Dr. Sid and Dr. K who helped on this project. Uh, Dr. Sid did the presentation to the CDC, did a fantastic job um, and um, we got an approval. So super exciting. Um, when you're out there, when you're at conferences, when you're talking to lots of other groups, other rare disease groups, other folks, it's really exciting all the things that kind of fall out of that. And we just wanted to share, we just heard about on, on Friday um, we just connected with a team at UCLA that is really interested in um, disorders in, in the classification of KS. And so they have an opportunity to participate in a study of movement. Um, they're trying to better understand movement and the way that uh, uh, syndromes like KS may affect the movement uh, in children. So they're interested in kids in the one to five year range. There's opportunities if you're in Southern California to participate locally, uh, but you can also participate remotely. And we will send out more information on this, but it's just exciting how many things are happening. And I just wanted to kind of share that excitement with, with all of you that we just keep finding things like this. There's so much going on. Um, and so stay tuned. Um, I just wanted to come back to this figure one more time. I think you've heard all the things we have to do. It's a lot and it's gonna take a long time. And I think we as a patient community have to really, we have to be impatient and patient at the same time, right? We have to be, we have to, we know there's urgency, but we also have to understand that these things are going to take a long time. It's going to take years. And, and when I was looking at all the work that still has to be done to get us to where we want to be, this quote, you know, came to mind, right? That I have nothing to offer, but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Um, and I, and I think that's true. This is, this is, 
going to be a long project for our community. But I think this quote also needs an upgrade, maybe a little slight edit. And I want to add one thing to it, which is also a little hope. And I think we should be hopeful. I think there's reasons to be excited, to be hopeful, um, and to look forward to the future. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's what I want to offer is a little bit of hope. Um, and I'm really excited to see the rest of this conference and um, all the presenters, all these fantastic people who have so much to share with us. So thank you to the, to the presenters. Thank you for attending um, and uh, can't wait for the next few days. Let's get it going. Eric, that's incredibly um, efficient on your behalf. That was 30 minutes uh, on the nose. So well done. Uh, a lot of information covered uh, for sure. You know, I just want to say um, to those of you guys who haven't met Eric or engaged with him, um, just how lucky we are as a community to have him in in this role as our chief scientific officer, as as a dad uh, to to a, a child with with Lipster syndrome. But having his acumen and his knowledge, um, we we referenced. You know, that there's going to be times where we fail. Right. There's going to be times where we celebrate and have successes. Um, the ICD-10 code, I don't want to undersell that uh, in the effort that Eric put into that. It was a huge effort. Um, I would say, you know, the year before, uh, myself and, and a couple of moms within the community, community Monica uh, Christie and, and Valerie Lascano, uh, we teamed up and we did a uh, original submission with Sid and it was declined. And, and the point of feedback that we received was that our patient community just wasn't um, big enough. You know, we, we didn't have the numbers. And so we brought that information to the community and the community responded. Right? And then Eric took it uh, and, and was able to really champion it with Sid and Dr. K, uh, which led to this. And now Eric was just at the Global Genes Conference uh, last week. And, and all these other patient advocacy organizations are, are coming to Eric as the expert in the room and saying, how did you do this? Right, And, and it's just, it's a really cool uh, thing to think, you know, we're three years in and just watching that, like I, I, I'm in this every single day with Eric, uh, but seeing it presented this way is just remarkable. There's there's so much being done. There's so much to do, but where we are right now, uh, we're, uh, we're feeling like we are really capturing some momentum. And, and I would agree that there's uh, definitely some reason uh, to hold hope uh, pretty closely. So.